So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today on cybersecurity and privacy, key principles and tools for older adults. I'm joined today by my colleague, Benedict Schefflon from the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse, who is co-hosting this uh, webinar series that we have um, in recognition of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So you can go on both of our websites and find out the other upcoming webinars that we have. We are also um, interested, if anyone is interested to get uh, further information around the Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we have the hashtag there around Get Cyber Safe, and there's uh, lots more information and resources around that Cybersecurity uh, Awareness Month. Just as an um, uh, acknowledgement, um, the webinar uh, today is has um, no information or opinions that are expressed here today are necessarily those of the Ontario government. Um, I'll talk about the, the funding for our organizations, but uh, we are independent uh, in terms of the webinar information that we are presenting today. Before we begin, I'd like to give our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of a number of First Nations and acknowledge their steward stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land one that is based in honor and deep respect. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Everyone will be muted during the session today. Our speakers will be visible um, during the presentation and during the question panel discussion that we have. Um, we have our ASL interpreters with us today. I also have enabled the, uh, um, the uh, dictation on the bottom for the transcript. If you want to just turn that on or off on your screen, you have that ability to do that as well. If you want to make the speakers larger as the PowerPoint is up, you can pull the screen across to the left and make those visuals a bit larger on your own screen. If you have a question that you'd like to ask during the session, we'd encourage you to put that in the Q&A box. It makes it a little bit easier for us to ensure that your question is answered. And if you want to make a comment or a suggestion or share a resource, you can put that into the chat box um, during the session today. We are recording the webinar um, and will be posted in a day or two on our websites for the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse and e Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario's website. We would like to remind you that we uh, really appreciate your feedback. If you wouldn't mind um, just completing a short webinar at the end of the session, just to give us your ideas and, and information on other um, future topics, that would be greatly appreciated. Just in respect to privacy and confidentiality, we just want to remind people that this is a uh, public forum. Um, if you like to um, talk to either one of the organizers, myself or Benedict, after about a personal circumstance or situation, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, if you have a general question about uh, something around cybersecurity that's personal, um, um, just be conscious that this is a public forum, but to keep things very general. And if you want something uh, as again, more specific information or details about your personal situation, um, again, just uh, email us or give us a call and we'd be pleased to assist you in the way that we can uh, offer you some assistance. So just a brief background about our organizations, Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario, is uh, envisions uh, a province where we see seniors being free and safe and have a voice um, in the community and are well respected. And the work that we do uh, around raising awareness and delivering education and training and working with like-minded organizations to ensure that we um, you know, achieve our mission. And we can't do this alone. We have to work collaboratively with our community partners. Um, that includes uh, yourselves and the other organizations across not only within Ontario, um, but across Canada and beyond those borders. 
So as I mentioned, um, just in terms of uh, our funding for our organization, we are funded through uh, the Ontario government under the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. And our mandate is to implement the Ontario strategy to combat elder abuse. And we've been um, doing this since 2003. And our tagline, um, which is uh, very uh, relevant and continues today, is to stop abuse and restore respect. And the fact that we all can play a role in, in doing this. And I think that um, myself and all my partners would probably agree in that uh, every small action can make a big difference um, in all the work that we do. So we have three main priorities that we work under, public education awareness, training, and uh, coordination of community services. Um, and those are the three main pillars of our, our strategy that we work with under um, and activities uh, that we um, work with our community partners and senior organizations to ensure seniors' rights and dignity are respected. If you haven't been to our website, I encourage you to check out um, the website or our social media channels. We have lots of information and posts where people can get further uh, resources and knowledge uh, around uh, elder abuse and the prevention reports, et cetera. Uh, lots of tools uh, available for people to download for free. Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Benedict, to talk a little bit about CNPA. Thank you, Rayan. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to see so many of you again today. Well, I'm uh, Benedict Shuplin. I'm the executive director of CNPEA, the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. Um, so we do work at the national level as well as the regional and provincial territorial level. Um, and our mission really is to connect people and organizations who do great work and help them kind of build that sense of community, foster the exchange of information and re reliable information and, uh, and knowledge, and also um, advance program and policy development when it comes to issues that are related to the well-being and the abuse of older adults. Um, we are very happy to be um, co-hosting this webinar today with EAPO, one of our longstanding partner, partners and collaborators. And I'll be the person asking questions of our uh, panelists very soon and also chiming in into the chat box. So um, please, if you are asking a question or need to know something and I've missed you, don't hesitate to type it all in again. I'll be uh, checking this out throughout the presentation. Um, and I see there's already a question of what are the websites. So I will repeat that for my organization, CNPEA. The website is cnpea.ca. And Brianne's organization is Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario, which is eapon.ca, and I'm put both in the chat box. I believe that's it for now. Thank you, Benedict. So I um, would like to give our. Um... I just want to give a information um, on our panelists today and talking about Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, you know, this is a Cybersecurity Awareness Month is an international recognized uh, day or, and campaign that's held every October to inform the public on the importance of cybersecurity. And if you want to get more information about this, the campaign specifically, you can go to Get Cyber Safe. Dot ca, dot gc, dot ca, and uh, Benedict can put that into the, the chat box for people to get more information. So the best way to raise awareness about cybersecurity is to have more organizations involved to be champions, to show older adults that they care and about their cybersecurity and to get cyber safe. So today we have invited guests who are champions, who are working diligently in their field to develop programs and innovative um, work uh, to create cyber safe spaces for older adults in their communities and developing resources so they can use that in their daily uh, lives and um, to ensure that their safety is protected. Because we do hear about so many frauds and scams that are happening, uh, unfortunately, particularly to older adults. Um, and there's so many other ways in terms of cybersecurity that they'll talk about today um, to ensure that seniors um, are safe. So I'd just like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Karen um, Bryson Bolvang, and she is the Director of Research at Media Smarts. 
and CARE is responsible for the planning, uh, planning methodology, implementation, and dissemination of key findings from the original Media Smarts research studies and evaluations of the Media Smarts program. She also is an adjunct research professor in sociology and anthropology at Carleton University. She works on a number of research projects, as you can see here, and works with um, different sectors and federal uh, departments on online issues related to cyber uh, security. She has extensive knowledge um, writing in academic journals, uh, presenting research, uh, conferences, um, and even parliamentary committees. So welcome, Kara. Next, we have Emily uh, Mullins, and who is a knowledge broker with the Ontario Age-Friendly Communities Outreach Program for the Centre for Studies in Aging and Health. And Emily, um, her background is she's a public health professional dedicated to improving the lives for older adults. She has a primary interest in public uh, sort of health promotion, um, the social determinants of health, and the social inclusion of older adults. As a research fellow at the Samuel Center for Social De Connectedness, Emily partnered with HelpAge to identify the best practices for building digital literacy among older adults. And she has, uh, in her current role, she supports over 70 communities across the province in their age-friendly planning and implementation. So welcome, Emily. And we also have with us Deborah uh, Popa. Uh, from, she is with Knowledge Flow uh, Cyber Safety Foundation, and she is the executive director. After many uh, years working in communications and human resources, Deborah took a career break to raise her children. Um, she now combines her passion for helping and protecting others, particularly children and seniors, um, for her love in educating and informing. And she basically says this is the best uh, job in the world and very proud of, of working with her team to make a difference in the lives of older adults. And the organization of Knowledge Flow, really, regardless of age or income, wants to make sure that the industry has the leading um, expertise, resources, and information, regardless of, um, of people's age and income, which gives us to her work that she's dealing with, um, working with older adults. And last, we have Lisa Kearney, and she is, um, uh, works with a, she's a founder of the nonprofit organization, Women Cybersecurity Society, and also the, um, uh, the International Women in Cyber Day. She's worked uh, in the industry for 26 years. She's, uh, besides leading the Global Security Operations Centers and cybersecurity programs, she's developed uh, cybersecurity courses and awareness training to thousands of people resulting in lowering the list risk and enhanced security protections for individuals. All of our speakers today have a wealth of information and knowledge uh, on programs that they share. Um, so we are looking so forward to um, hearing from them and the programs they have that you can then take back to your own communities or uh, in your own personal life and, uh, and utilize them. So I'm going to turn it over to Benedict, and she can start our conversation with our, our speakers today. Thank you, Ryan. So just a quick reminder before I get started, again, uh, feel free to chat, exchange comments, anything you want in the chat box. And then if you have specific questions for our presenters or Ryan and I, please use the Q&A box that will help us keep track of everything because it gets quite busy in the chat box really fast. So um, I'll... Yeah, I'll get us started. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to uh, welcome of our panelists today for um, this event for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, we are 
looking forward to hearing from you about the work that you do because I know there's been you're, you've been doing a lot uh, recently um, particularly when it comes to supporting older adults in beefing up on their knowledge and their own you know ensuring their own security online so before we get into the thick of thing my first question is this let's kind of define the terms because we talk a lot about cybersecurity. we hear a lot about digital digital literacy so what do these terms mean what exactly does that can you define those terms for us and explain why it is important and why we should all care about them um i'll start with kara if you want to get us started Sure, and thanks so much for, for having me. Um, as, as you know, I, I work with MediaSmart, so we're Canada Center for Digital Media Literacy. Um, and, and for us, you know, at its core, digital media literacy is about sort of four things. It's about access and then being able to use, understand, create and engage with technology. Um, and all of this so that folks who are online can feel confident uh, and also safe to actively participate um, in as what we call sort of ethical digital citizens. Um, and so a big part of that, of course, is, um, as I mentioned, you know, feeling safe and feeling confident is, of course, um, equipping ourselves with sort of cybersecurity skills, if you will, um, which I'm sure we will uh, talk a, a lot about in detail today and provide a lot of the tips and tricks that I'm sure many of us know. Um, but but for us at Media Smart, you know, cybersecurity is, is of course, uh, and, and privacy is, of course, really important to our capacity to feel safe and secure online. But digital media literacy is a sort of a combination of those those four key things that, you know, they, they, to be able to use, understand, um, create and engage with technology. So that's what digital media literacy is is to us and um and yeah i'm sure we'll, we'll dive into some more of the specifics of of uh, cyber security so i won't i won't uh, i'll leave it at that for now thank you well i guess i'll turn it to lisa because lisa it is uh, quite literally in the name of your organization uh, women Cybersecurity society so you recently hosted uh, an international symposium uh for women in cyber and the theme the, the, this year was education, safety, and security for women and girls. Um, so from, you've now had a few weeks to kind of process everything that was said and, and discussed at the, uh, the symposium. Can you share some highlights or some, some kind of key notes from this conference and from um, what people should know and consider about cybersecurity? Yes, I, I'd love to. Thank you so much, uh, Benedict. Uh, before we do, though, I just want to kind of define what the definition of cybersecurity is, if you don't mind. Uh, so from an enterprise perspective and from an individual perspective, cybersecurity is the act of the protection of assets. Assets include network systems, data and people, and ensuring the confidentiality, integrity and availability of those assets. So from an individual perspective for today's discussion, I would say making sure that you have access to your accounts, that make sure that your accounts are secure, make sure that your privacy is protected online and make sure that you stay safe while you're online. So with regard to the event, International Women in Cyber Day Symposium, it was our fourth annual um, conference. And the theme, as you mentioned, for this year was education, safety, and security of women and girls. And that really focuses on um, the, um, the importance of recognizing and achieving and acknowledging uh, the efforts of women and girls in the security and tech sector. And with regards to education, safety, and security of women and girls, what we have seen as a result of the pandemic, a lot of women, uh, especially in, uh, uh, in Canada, there is such a low percentage of representation of women in cybersecurity, only about 10%. And there's also a lot of inherent bias um, and bullying and harassment. One of the themes also with this year's event, of course, was making sure that there was di digital literacy and access to awareness and education for older persons. So we're really thrilled 
uh, to have Benedict and Ray Ann speak at the event. Um, and in particular, um, with regard to International Women in Cyber Day, it was really important for us to recognize women who haven't been recognized in the industry. So we selected, we were very fortunate to find one particular woman. Her name is Sylvia Gelman. You can find her on our website if you go to womencybersecuritysociety.org forward slash blog to read her story. She's a 101 year old woman who is very capable, very active still. And she was part of Canada's very first uh, women's cybersecurity team. She worked with a unit called the Examination Unit uh, through the Canadian government, which was a top secret bureau. Um, and she was not recognized. She was more or less a hidden figure. So we wanted to recognize her efforts and her work during World War II. Um, and so we gave her a special award. And so with that said, I think you know, as a takeaway from today's event is really looking for the opportunities for women to not only be more cyber secure and have more awareness and education on the issue, but also maybe to consider cybersecurity as a career option because of the skills gap that we need to fill here in Canada. That's an excellent answer. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that you uh, mentioned Ms. Gelman because I guess my next question for you had to do with ageism. When we're talking about uh, matters of technology in general, um, there seems to be um, rather negative ageist thoughts about and, and assumptions about what older people can and cannot do. Uh, whether you know the, this idea that uh, oh seniors can't even use a smartphone properly, plus also a, cer a certain level of self-inflicted ageism of people starting to declare that maybe they're too old to try to keep up with technology and kind of slowly retreating from it as a result from that. So is that something that you've encountered um, while you were working on developing some of your programs and your initiatives? Uh, and that can, you know, is that that ageism barrier? Was that something that you had to contend with? And so how did you overcome it? Yes, that's a really great question. Um, through the nonprofit and you know, individually and personally, I get asked that question a lot. Women, I don't hear it from men, but women will say, hey, I'm a certain age, am I too old to start a career in cybersecurity? And I will say that some of these women are in their 30s when they're asking this question. So to me, it's, a, it's more of a cultural and a societal issue because these kinds of ideologies are put in women's mind at a very young age that they can't do something new or they're too old to learn. Um, but it also results in, you know, a little bit of the imposter syndrome. So for us, through the nonprofit, our mission is to advance and retain women and diversity and older persons and people from diverse backgrounds are really important to that diversity component. And they bring many advantages to the cybersecurity industry. For myself, I'm in my 50s. I started when I was in my 20s, this industry. So I've been in the industry a long time. Um, but and I and because of that, I bring unique advantages. And so do other women in various careers, not such cybersecurity. But it is a challenge and it is something that we're working to educate more people on because every person, regardless of age, has something meaningful to contribute to the workforce. Agreed, thank you. Emily, do you have uh, anything, to, any feelings regarding that question about ageism? Yes, absolutely. And firstly, thank you for the invitation to participate today. Um, in my research, um, internalized ageism was a theme within the literature. Um, and there are a lot of negative stereotypes around older adults um, that are perpetuated in the media. For example, that older adults are incompetent uh, when it comes to technology. Many older adults feel that they're too old to engage with technology or to learn technology and felt that they would never be able to keep up um, or to catch up with the younger generation. Generation. And so in reality, older adults are not a homogenous group. Um, they have varying levels of skills and interest in technology. Um, and so to combat sort of this internalized ageism, it was important to have volunteers that were encouraging. Um, it was important for the training to be delivered at a slow pace and with lots of repetition. And this contributed to building older adults' confidence. Thank you very much. Deborah. you've also recently developed some new programs for uh, older adults, particularly. What's What are your thoughts on this? I would say that's our number one barrier, given our focus, 
is the self-inflicted ageism. It's it's really the, the biggest thing we've had to deal with. And so what we've been trying to do is not only have the sessions in person where possible, where of course that was very difficult during the pandemic, things are slowly getting back to normal. So we've been able to address that somewhat, but also to not focus on, uh, and I think this question comes up in a few minutes, to not focus on pairing uh, an older person with a younger person necessarily, but having you know a similar aged mentor uh, has been one of the greatest uh, successes for us is to make sure they're really comfortable feeling like they're dealing with a peer and not necessarily someone who is, you know, better at or, you know, is more comfortable with technology. Like learning together is less daunting. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Um, so how, I mean, the, I guess I kind of want to get because we, we've already kind of addressed partially the, the question here, but I'm I'm curious about the matters um, because <laughs> trying to form my thought here. Uh, so technology is now something we use for everything: banking, shopping, booking healthcare appointments. It's becoming more and more prominent, and for people who do not have access to either the skills, the technology, the data, um, it becomes a lot more challenging to do everyday small things, particularly during the pandemic. Um, so it's becoming crucial to have access to a phone, a smartphone, to know how to use it, which means that it's becoming a barrier for some people. So uh, I know, Emily, recently you worked on kind of compiling best practices for uh, building digital literacy. And you also looked at what programs exist across the country. Um, and I, one of them being Dig It. So I would love to hear about that as well. You know, how, can you tell, most, tell us more about this particular work and also how this connects with the idea of social inclusion? Because if you can't do all those everyday things, little by little, you kind of fall off to the wayside and you lose your ability to connect with people. So how does that, those, those two spheres of your work in, uh, interlock? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll give a little bit of background about the Digit program. Um, it's, it's provided by Help Age Canada, which is a national charity dedicated to improving the quality of life of older adults in Canada and internationally. And digital literacy is one of their flagship programming areas. So Digit is a national program and it's um, it provides devices, data, um, IT support and training to low income older adults who are beginners with technology. And so as part of my research, I spoke with older adult participants in the program, um, volunteers, researchers and academics, as well as individuals um, from organizations across North America um, that were providing digital literacy training to older adults. And so from this research, I compiled six best practices um, for building digital literacy among older adults. Um, and so um, the first one is that the community, uh, the program is community based with flexible program delivery models. So, for example, providing one to one training, uh, group based sessions, as well as drop in sessions. Um, that there's also a focus on accessibility. So the tablet was a preferred um, device because of its portability and um, large screen for those with visual impairments. Um, another best practice that I identified was the marketing of the training. So it's important to focus on um, what older adults were interested in. And for most older adults, it was um, to connect with their families. Um, peer to peer teaching, as um, was mentioned earlier, was also an effective strategy. Um, having older adult tech experts teach older adult beginners um, made it possible to learn um, that technology, you can learn technology at an advancing age. And lastly, the cybersecurity training um, involved throughout the curriculum, um, creating an awareness you know, of common scams and how to keep your personal information safe. And so um, in terms of the social inclusion aspect, um, digital literacy can really bridge the digital divide and connect older adults to online programming. Um, it can increase their social participation. And so it's a, it's a great strategy. Um, some communities have developed tablet lending programs through local libraries. Um, there have been initiatives where um, people donate devices for low income older adults. And some have partnered with organizations like HelpAge and Cyber Seniors, for example, to offer digital literacy training programs. 
That's great. Thank you. Um, do you happen to know um, if somebody wants to figure out whether their library offers such a thing? Is there, I mean, obviously, other than going straight to the library and asking, let's say that's, you know, maybe not a possibility. Is there a place where people can find this out? I'm not sure of like a compiled list, but um, if you reach out to your local library, I'm sure that they'd be able to um, provide information. Okay, wonderful. And so I guess I can turn the next question to Debra. Um, do you, have you encountered that question of the matter of access to internet connection or access to equipment? You know, how do you get around it? Is this something that you've experienced? We have to some degree, and what we did is just what you said, the local library. We've partnered with lots of libraries in our area to make sure that if people didn't have access, that that was a, a place they could go. We also have a community hub here in our local community that um, received funding for tablets and also Wi-Fi sticks. So we were able to make sure that the people who came to our programming did have access. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely an issue. And so can you tell us more about uh, your work? So the platform is knowledgewise.ca that is particularly uh, geared towards older adults. What led you to choose this focus on older people and develop this platform in particular? Yeah, we actually have several. So KnowledgeWise is one of them. It's kind of more general cyber safety type information. So it has you know training videos, it has tip sheets. They're available in multiple languages. So if somebody you know, maybe speaks simplified Chinese or you know, Tamil, what have you, that's available on the website. Uh, then we have Knowledge Connect, which is specifically about safety when doing online video conferencing. So like at the beginning, in the beginning of this session, you reminded people, don't discuss you know, individual situations, don't share personal information, that kind of thing, which a lot of groups you know, aren't necessarily aware of. They aren't reminding people to do that kind of thing turning your cameras off when you start the call so people behind you aren't being recorded, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's our Knowledge Connect. Uh, it, all of our resources are available on the site for free. And our current project is Knowledge Web, which ties in with some of the work from your panelists today about digital financial literacy. So not so much digital literacy, not so much financial literacy, but digital financial. So when you're dealing with things like online banking, maybe sending information back and forth to your um, financial advisor, that kind of thing. How do you do that safely, given that so many groups are now not doing in-person uh, appointments? So before when you would you know, go to see your bank manager and you would bring your paperwork, now you've got to send it. And a lot of people aren't comfortable with that. So that's the kind of stuff we're working on right now. And I think like a lot of people, it was really the pandemic that kind of forced these issues into the forefront and specifically in our literally brought it to our doorstep with our own family seeing, you know, how do people make doctor appointments? How do they go to the bank now? You know, all that kind of stuff. So it was really thanks to COVID that we started working on these programs and we're, we were luckily able to get uh, the funding because of the pandemic and we were able to bring these programs and we provide them all for free. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I see this is uh, starting to ignite the conversation in the chat with people uh, exchanging various resources. Uh, so we have glue digital skills for modern seniors. We made it stick. Uh, we have uh, Audlin.ca, a digital literacy network focusing on issues unique to the 2SLGBTQ plus older adults population. So do check them out as well. And since we're talking about resources, I know Kara, your organization, Media Smarts, is also uh, planning a bunch of events. There's a lot coming up to um, um, go through or take us through Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Can you tell us about a few things that might be of interest for our listeners? Yeah, for sure. So uh, a couple of um, things I would flag is that uh, at the end of this month, uh, from October 24th to the 28th, uh, it's uh, Media Literacy Week. This will be the 17th annual Media Literacy Week that Media Smarts is uh, hosting and, and, and running. There's a bunch of different events. You can go to medialiteracyweek.ca. I can put the link in the chat in a moment. And you can follow that for resources as well as a, there's an event page with other webinars and other workshops and um, I will have facilitators running sessions. There's a couple around online basics. So that's things like how to feel more confident with getting online um, and accessing things like apps and other sort of basic tools. 
And then there will be some other um, sessions more specific to online safety, privacy, and cybersecurity. Um, so you can look for some of those. And then we also have a program that I think was probably most specific to what uh, we're talking about today or relevant is our digital smarts program. So I'll put that in uh, the chat as well. Um, and it's a six uh, session sort of um, series of workshops and you can kind of pick and choose um, depending on your comfort level and where you feel your sort of skills are, whether you need to start at a more basic place or whether you want to dig into some um, perhaps more advanced uh, skills. It's a combination of sort of digital skills, um, but it's also some of those critical competencies I mentioned earlier that are key to digital literacy. So things like mis and disinformation, um, navigating online privacy, um, that goes kind of a little bit further than some of the basics or so some skills, but also thinking about things like audience settings on things like different social networks that you're thinking about, not just your own privacy, but as we know, privacy is relational. So you might want to be sharing um, important family memories, but, you know, needing to think about things like consent. So asking family members, you know, grandkids, nieces, nephews, if it's okay to post photos of them, for example. So those are just some tidbits of some of the things that we'll be covering or we do cover in some of those workshops. They all come with short animated videos. There are worksheets. Um, for example, in the online um, privacy and safety session, there's a whole worksheet around passwords and a whole bunch of different links to different tools that can help you manage passwords um and uh and different yeah different ways that you can explore and practice the skills um and the last thing i'll say is just to echo what um the other panelists have said that um through that work in the, and we did uh, develop that program in partnership with ywca canada we also certainly learned that the peer-to-peer -peer approach um was a great success so um i just wanted to echo that as well thank you that's wonderful i'm actually all quite surprised um by this the fact that the peer-to-peer -peer dynamics is so popular because i think um well, many of us have always thought you know building relationship between cohorts and having people from different you know generations kind of meet and, and exchange was great but really glad to hear that there uh there's something that's proving to be even more successful than this. Um, so we can always revisit this, this topic at the end. And thank you. Um, if everybody is interested in what Kara was just talking about, she just posted a few more links in the chat box. So we were on the, the online privacy matters, and I thought that was really interesting what you're talking about, you know, that question of asking consent before you share photos, before you reveal any information that might uh, essentially uh, have to do with other people and not just you. Uh, and I know, Deborah, recently you developed something, and I thought that was really interesting, that um, it, that was focused on online privacy, particularly for people who work in long-term care and who provide support to older adults. Can you tell us more about this? So I would love it. I, I think that's fascinating. Yeah, it was part of our Knowledge Connect series, which was about, you know, using video apps. Uh, and again, because of the pandemic, uh, it really brought home to us with our own uh, situation with my grandma in her long-term care home is really where the light bulb went off, um, finding that the people who were actually in the care homes running the sessions hadn't been given any of the actual training or any of the kind of um, uh, knowledge behind why certain things need to be done a certain way to protect the, the resident's privacy. So things like not necessarily having the resident who was the subject of the visit alone in a room. So they may have had other residents who were listening in on the call and hearing other information that they shouldn't have been privy to. Uh, in some cases, it was staff sharing information that probably should not have been shared with someone who was not actually legally the power of attorney for help in some situations. Um, but yeah, lots of little things like that. The, the privacy of the family members wasn't being respected in terms of their email addresses, phone numbers, uh, the, the tablets or the laptops that were being used for the calls were also the, the tablets that were being used for um, other um, events. So in some cases, residents were seeing people's contact information and they, you know, they shouldn't have, you know, little things like that, that, you know, to the people who are frontline, they don't necessarily know why that's a big deal 
to someone like, you know, who's in the in the security industry, <laughs> we gap. <laughs> and, you know, meanwhile, the people who are frontline don't, they're just not given the information as to why that's important. So we did develop the toolkit. Um, it's a document and it doesn't have to necessarily be only used by people, you know, in long term care. It's really meant for any nonprofit who may be running virtual visits in their whatever their programming happens to be. So it's available there on our website. So please feel free to download it and use it. And like I said, it's really meant for any nonprofit that is dealing with virtual visits. That was going to be my next question. You know, can do you do you see this program being adapted for other services that provide support? So it's somebody who works in a in a senior center or somebody who works in I don't know I'm, any setting really where they are working with the public could take or could download this information and and apply it. Yeah, absolutely. And we made another document specifically for nonprofits around handling uh, uh, personal information. So even though in, for a lot of us nonprofits, we're not necessarily um, compelled legally to comply with some of the privacy legislation, we should be complying with it anyway, just in terms of best practices, protecting donor information, sponsor information, that kind of thing. So we have lots of resources available for nonprofits for free on our website. So please use them. That's what they're there for. Amazing. I actually think I'm going to go and take a spin there myself. Yes, please do. Please do. <laughs> Um, so actually, I, this is a question I, I will open up to everyone, because as we discussed, technology is now becoming part of everyday activities and every aspect of life. So this is um, even entering the realm of such thing as uh, drafting a will or drafting a power of attorney. It is now possible to do these kinds of things online in some cases, in some places. Um, are you aware of any programs that are available for legal professionals that might want to learn more on how to best keep their clients safe? There obviously uh, there's a legal practice angle to this that you know is being addressed by the, the legal community, but Technology-wise, are you aware of anything that uh, legal professionals could use? I, I think for me, anyway, when I looked at that question, I thought, okay, there's legal professionals who may be working in the nonprofit sector, mm -hmm. which would be very different than a legal professional who maybe has a larger law practice. Um, so I would say for the one group, yeah, you need a, an expert certified privacy and security program. For the people who are working more in the nonprofit space, um, we can certainly help with some of the, the free online stuff that we've developed. But to me, it's more about how can a person, how can a, particularly an older adult, recognize when they're dealing with someone who doesn't have a strong security program? And there's going to be some kind of red flags that they'll see. So if, say, their lawyer says, send me you know, whatever document by email. Are they asking for documents to be password protected? If they're not, you're gonna you you really should be looking for another service provider. Are they being asked for um, a remote access to their computer? So if a you know a service provider says, oh, just let me do it. Here's a link to click on, and I'll just do it for you. I'll fill in the form for you. That's a massive red flag that they shouldn't be dealing with that person. Is there a, you know, a portal for uploading information securely? And if there is, does it have two-factor uh, authentication on the account? So to me, I'd rather focus on sort of what the red flags would be for the, the, um, the client as opposed to the person who's making the money <laughs> from, my, from my perspective. So that, that's how I was looking at that question. Thank you. Yes, that's a great question and a great answer. And actually, that kind of leads us into my next question, which is going to be um, asking each of you, okay, top five tips, because I know a lot of people are here kind of waiting with their pen and paper, um, or maybe tablets, hopefully. Um, what, let's do a roundtable starting with Lisa, because uh, I know that is a topic you've also addressed uh, in, the, in your conference and you address in your work every day. So somebody, an older person who is you know thinking about this and wants to make sure that they're putting all the assets on their side to stay safe what would you say are the top five must have or must do that they should think about and get or look into you are muted Lisa. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I just want to uh, mention as well that I did share the link with you of our current um, newsletter, which contains these top five to, uh, mentions that I'm going to um, uh, talk about now. So the number one is you want to protect your accounts by enabling two-factor authentication. Uh, number two, you want to look into using a VPN, which is a virtual private network. Uh, number three, you want to consider using a password manager, which allows for um, the remember, you only have to remember one password, it has to be complex, but allows you to create complex passwords for all of your accounts and enable um, two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Uh, number three, uh, you want to make sure that you use a secure browser when interacting online um, and make sure that your email service provider and when you're sending, this was mentioned in the previous uh, topic with Deborah with regards to legal, when you're sending documents by email, uh, and this is not, this is in addition to the other top five topics or recommendations, but when you're sending uh, important documents to a legal or another advisor, you wanna make sure that your email service provider, they're, they're enabling end-to-end -end encryption. That way the document doesn't have to be encrypted before sending or attaching, uh, but the end-to-end -end encryption, and you can check that out if you're using Gmail or Hotmail, you can just Google how to check for end-to-end -end encryption within the body of the email. And I would say the last one I would uh, recommend is um, be careful for social engineering, especially for older persons. When you're interacting with the public or in a public space, make sure that people aren't shoulder surfing. So people are looking over your shoulder to see what's on your screen. You can use a privacy protector. Um, make sure that, and it was already touched on, that people aren't within hearing distance. If you're going to schedule appointments with legal advisors or people that are taking care of your legal affairs, make sure to book a private space when doing so. Thank you very much. I was about to ask you to specify what you meant by social engineering, but I think you've just uh, answered the question already. Um, I've typed those th six uh, advice in the chat box and I'm going to put them here. If anybody has any questions about some specifics, please use the Q&A box, of course, um, to inquire about them. Um, Kara. What are you might have some overlap with with Lisa, but uh, is there are there other advice that you would give that are things that we should all do regardless of age? Yeah, I mean, I think Lisa's five are, are I would agree. I, I think I would just add um, and kind of along what she was speaking about in terms of social engineering. Uh, these these are covered in detail if you want to look at either the discovering online safety or navigating online safety uh, workshops in the digital smarts link I already posted. Um, but um, just to also be aware of the way that you're accessing the internet um, and uh, and by that I mean whether you're accessing it in a private way so like uh, or in a public so public Wi-Fi and just to be really cognizant of what you're doing when you're on public Wi-Fi um, so you know we recommend you know not doing things like online banking or um, you know engaging in uh, kinds of activities that will require you input a lot of personal information, for example. And I know that can be tricky because for some folks, public Wi-Fi is one of the only ways that they can access the internet. So being really cognizant of that, uh, the VPN, as uh, uh, Lisa mentioned, is really helpful for that. Um, but also, you know, going to some trusted sources. So. Um, thinking about uh, similarly like if you're in the library but using like a, uh, I think as Deborah kind of mentioned or you're using a public sort of lended device again we have to be really cognizant of making sure you clear all kinds of caches after you've signed on or you know make sure you fully exit out of apps and sign off of all of the apps so nobody can re-sign you know into your account or your app if you're using a shared device um, so we have some, uh, some, some more along those lines about how we're accessing the internet. So whether you have access to a private device that is just your own um, and, and, and um, again, public Wi-Fi. And then the other thing I would mention is just around it is we've kind of tap danced around it. And I know it's like we could do a whole other session around sort of scams, you know, phishing scams, different things that would put like malware and spyware on your uh, devices. And so we have lots of tips and tricks for that. But I would just say as a sort of general practice, 
to be sort of really um, cognizant of any kind of emails or messages or requests that are asking you to either click into a link or for your personal information. Um, and I think the biggest, you know, thing I can say around um, a lot of the scams that are trying to play on our emotions, you know, make you feel like someone's in harm or, or, or needs assistance. In those instances, we really just strongly recommend that you uh, reach out to that person through another way. So if it's somebody you know, and they, you know, they're saying, I need you to send me a gift card or money for X, message them, you know, outside, the, if it's an email, send them a message, pick up the phone, you know, make a call and check, check in with that person if you are worried that they are in danger or you're concerned about, about harm. But um, don't click on any links and, and don't, you know, uh, share personal information unless you're, like, and, you know, really confident that it is for us specific um, uh, purpose like uh, a legal purpose or a service that you have actually initiated and requested. Uh, I just yeah. add one comment uh, yes. from what I said. Um, it's important, yes, to if you have the opportunity to clear your cash and all that stuff, but the emphasis should be on the service provider or the computer operator or the computer owner to have settings in place so that when a user logs in, all of that is deleted. So cash is cleared, you know, browser cookies are gone, all of that stuff. Um, so if you have the opportunity to ask someone to put that in place, uh, you know, to talk to an agency or a group home or maybe a family um, community center, um, you know, they can make arrangements to have that taken care of rather than putting the emphasis on each individual to have to do that themselves and try to remember. I was about to say that's a lot of words, you know, just just hearing them, you know, the VPN, the double, the multi authentication, the all of this can sound a little daunting. <laughs> so I'm glad you you mentioned this. Um, and that kind of brings me as you you were talking about, you started talking, Kara, about um, scams and you know things like this. Immediately, my brain went to social media, the ever present and constantly growing activity for most of us, and particularly older adults. Uh, Emily, do you have any nuggets of wisdom for people who are uh, using social media a lot to stay in touch with their family members, for instance? What are the, the top few things they should always keep in mind? Yeah, um, it is very common for older adults to want to, you know, go on social media to connect with family and friends. Um, I think it's important to, you know, never accept a friend request from somebody that you don't know. Um, if you get, you know, unwanted messages, don't click on any links like it was said before. Um, yeah, just being aware of what you're posting and, and your privacy settings on the app. So if you're, you know, public, everyone can see that or you could limit it to, you know, just your friends or just certain people that can see your content. Great, thank you. Any further comments? I know we could probably go for a while. There are many, many tips and tricks. I think you've all, you've all said your piece on this one. Okay, wonderful. Um, and so that kind of brings us back to what we started touching on earlier in the during the session is what have you found were the most effective approaches in reaching and teaching older adults about technology? Because actually one person asked in the, in the chat box earlier, uh, you know, if we were providing this information and this type of session in other ways that are not Zoom, because how do we reach people who are not already online or do not have somebody to assist them with getting online, which is a very fair question. So how do you go about this in your work? What are the the, the best way that you reach people first? Uh, let's start with who have I not heard from in a little bit? Deborah? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I would say the the main thing is having seniors talking to each other. So I've noticed recently, for example, just on my Facebook feed. So somebody has seen a scam and they're actually now sharing that and saying, oh, I just received this email. Uh, and, you know, here's why I didn't click on it. So which is great. The only thing that you have to keep in mind is we need to kind of get away from uh, the messaging that the, the person uh, fell victim or the person got tricked or um, we just have to be careful that we're not making people feel like it was their mistake that they fell for it. So I think keeping in mind some of the wording, some of the messaging around, you know, how we're talking about scams is really important. Um, but making sure that they're, the seniors are talking to each other, I think, is the, you know, the main way we're going to address this. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Lisa? From time to time, we host workshops uh, that teach about, you know, the top five or the top 10 things. Um, recently, we held a workshop how to implement uh, best practices when it comes to securing your accounts and securing your devices. Uh, one other thing that wasn't really touched on here was um, making sure that you patch all of your devices. So when, um, you know, vulnerability becomes available, you, your endpoint to become compromised with malware or ransomware of some sort. So you want to make sure that you update not just your operating system, but your applications as well. And really, really important uh, for older persons, especially when they're protecting their, you know, um, sensitive, sensitive data or data that's important to them, like photos and mementos, is backup. Backup all of your systems and Windows and app or, or Mac OS operating systems both have the ability to schedule those backups regularly and automatically. So if you have someone that knows how to do that, you can ask them to do it. All you have to do, you can back up to the cloud or you can back up to a local external hard drive. And if you don't know how to do it, just ask a friend or a loved one with that expertise. Thank you. Those are all excellent advice. And as, I, as you're speaking and making check marks, I'm like, well, didn't do that. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm being reminded of a few things in my, myself. Um, Emily, so the work that you've done recently between uh, with um, kind of mapping out existing programs across the country and seeing what the best practices are, did it give you a sense? Like, did you observe maybe a, if there was an increase in engagement of older people with programs of this nature in recent years? Do you get a sense that it's starting to pick up or? Yeah, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, as was mentioned earlier, um, with many of the services provided by, you know, uh, community centers and libraries moving online, um, a lot of older adults found themselves, um, you know, they needed to learn how to engage with this type of technology. So um, the digital divide was really never so apparent than it was during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and programs are increasingly being offered as hybrid models now um, for older adults that are sort of reluctant to return to in-person services. And I think that will really be the way of the future. And so digital literacy is really essential for the social participation and continued social participation of these older adults. Thank you. Kara, uh, any thoughts on this question? Yeah, and I just I, I see a couple of, like a question in the chat that I think is like similarly like getting at, at some of this and thinking about people who aren't are already online or don't have access. And I think one of the things with our digital smarts uh, program in particular was that it was um, geared towards underrepresented and specifically folks who ne weren't necessarily already online. And one of the things we found to be most effective kind of thinking about some of the other comments made here is specifically for folks, either service providers or folks in, um, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, homes for older adults and so on is to make sure that we are, you know, providing like, access and real time support. So the opportunity to learn things uh, with someone uh, sort of in the room in the moment, but then also have all kinds of information uh, and, and um, resources that they can return to. So it was about like really scaffolding that learning opportunity and not sort of like, here you have your 30 minute workshop, off you go. And we heard really clearly that that was really overwhelming for folks, you know, like it's, as we've been seeing, like it's a lot of information that can get thrown, you know, to someone in a short period of time. So um, just making sure that whatever we have, friend whatever we um whatever you know whatever is communicated in a, uh, like an in-person session you know and, and having opportunities for sort of tangible tactile learning is great but making sure that you know when they go home or when they're you know working independently they have recall opportunities with resources to support that learning um and you know just it's good for all of us. I mean, I am often like, you know, I'll get, you know, an update on some kind of privacy or security. Um, I know when we put two factor authentication and different things into, you know, once we started working remotely, I needed lots of reminders. So those are just nice, nice to have those, you know, go to notes and, and things that are both visual and, and keeping all those things in mind. So I would just say, 
if you're, you're, you're looking to, you know, make it as accessible as possible, especially for people who aren't um, readily online is, is just providing other forms like handouts and, and other sort of um, places they can go to, to have that um, information to return to. Thank you. And apparently we can add to the list also uh, bringing this in conversation during peer-to-peer uh, -peer activities, uh, because it seems to be one of the keys that uh, one of the things that emerged from the, the conversation today is that sense of it's easier to learn and it's less daunting to take that first step if you're doing it with somebody that is that you recognize as being a peer, because if you can see it, you can be it kind of thing, right? So it's really good to hear that, not to say that intergenerational uh, digital literacy programs are not also wonderfully valid, but uh, there are maybe options to consider if you are considering uh, creating something like this in your community. And I, I've seen a few comments from people saying that they were curiously taking notes um, to try to kind of ignite something in their in their community. So uh, Emily, if you don't mind, I will be sharing the link to your best practices report so that it can help people um, but right. find out more about what's what they need to keep in mind if they're hoping to put something together like this and then we've been talking for a while i'm sorry we went a bit over time but that was really interesting so um let's see if what we have in the q a um oh well i guess we're back with the question from ashley asking um how are we reaching seniors who do not currently have digital access so because there are a lot of people who might want to do this but they find it intimidating and they maybe don't have the equipment just yet um, and they're too nervous to go to in-person events because of COVID. So what are ideas that, creative ideas that could be implemented to reach these people? You might have some personal experience with some of this. <laughs> do we, let's see, do I see somebody volunteering? <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. I'll speak up. Okay, go ahead. During our conference, we had to do, um, in order to get Sylvia on screen, uh, her caretaker, who was an older woman in her 60s, uh, we had to do an information session and how to set all of that up. And one thing that I found really important, it can be done remotely, but a couple of things that stood out to me, which was really important, making sure that you have a good internet connection, because if you don't have a good internet connection, it's gonna create a lot of frustration and people are just gonna to wanna to give up because they just feel it's too hard or too difficult. Uh, number two is you wanna be very patient and very slow and really break it down as simple as possible uh, and address one topic at a time. Um, for us, I mean, it took me about four hours just to cover a couple of topics, and we had to do three sessions. So patience is needed, I think, um, you know, a good internet connection for working remotely, and having the option to work remotely as well is really important, and really focus on the individual needs of that particular person, because maybe the person doesn't use Facebook, or maybe they do, and they want, that's their only way to keep in touch with family and grandchildren, or maybe they only want to use email, or maybe they don't know how to use email. So focus on, on the topics where you can provide the most impact for their online learning and safety. Thank you. And, and if I could add, sorry, my internet died. So I was gone for a few minutes. <laughs> Speaking of having a good internet connection. <laughs> um, one of the things that we've been trying to come up with are ideas like you said, so if the people aren't already online, if they're not going to the library or doing senior center type groups because of the pandemic, how do we get to the seniors? So yeah, I, that's, an, that's like the $64,000 question. So one of the things we're talking about is, do we go to doctor's offices? Do we go to, you know, what other places are seniors for sure going to where we can reach them? So where, and this is one of the things that we're addressing right now. I don't have the answer, but this is one of the topics that, yeah, we need to figure this out because just putting out, you know, on social media that there's a seminar coming up isn't reaching the vast majority of the seniors who truly need the information that we have. So, yeah, we're working on it. 
I just had a question too, just building on the the peer to peer um, work that's been done. Uh, there hasn't has anybody been doing intergenerational kind of work in schools with um, older adults? Because I know years before, I know and probably currently, um, you know, high school students would go into like say retirement homes or other senior centers um, to teach. And I know that there are programs out there. I'm just wondering if anybody's has experience uh, with that about teaching around cybersecurity or NOAA programs, that kind of thing. Nope. Doesn't I know, look like it. Oh, sorry. Oh, I know ahead. Cyber Seniors is um, an intergenerational program, um, and they do have sort of high school students and um, university students that are volunteering, um, you know, to get their 40 hours and things like that um, with older adults. Um, it is one of the organizations that I spoke to um, in my research, so you can sort of read more about that in the uh, document that was shared in the chat. Thank you. Ryan, before we go any further, we have a participant who would like to know, is there a way for uh, an attendee to ask a question out loud because their typing is not, not their forte? Um, I can promote them to a panelist and ask them. Okay, so <clears throat> Jules Moore is hoping to ask a question, talking about making things a little bit more individualized, um, <laughs> like Lisa was saying. So and meanwhile, just, I see there, I just, uh, so Jules, you've been promoted, so you can actually ask your question. Well, uh, can you hear me? I yes, can. I can. Well, thank you. Uh, this is super important uh, stuff. Um, just uh, more insight, but something to consider. I don't think it's just relegated to uh, older adults, but even though this is what you're talking about, I, I kind of work in the tech center sector, in fact, on a bit of cybersecurity, but just a little bit. Uh, I think it's, uh, yesterday I had an experience and I was just interested. So I called Microsoft and got a, an amazing result. They're having some sessions. And I said, you know, can I just speak to someone? And I, what I wanted to know was the basics, like two-factor auth auth authentication, most people don't know what that is. Most people, like I said, so if I install this upgraded enhancement, can I still use a program for spam or malware called malware bytes or bit defender, whatever? And uh, I got some really satisfactory answers because when I look on the internet, it gives you all these different opinions on whether you can conflict and that sort of thing. So to answer your question on how to get seniors, it's true, but they need a, a telephone, some sort of telephone old technology might be something because a lot of people relate to that. And it's just something to consider. I, I've been in the long-term care sector it's difficult at best with all the stuff out there because of the avalanche of, of information out there and who to trust. And I think what you're doing is absolutely critical and good, good on you. So I'll just leave it at that. I don't know if there's any question, but that's what I wanted to share. Thank you, Jules, for, for sharing that. We really appreciate your, your comments. And I think, Rianne, that kind of aligns with what you were telling somebody in the chat box about the fact that EAPO is working with uh, Senior Centers Without Walls, which is phone-based. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us a bit more about this for people who are curious? Yeah, so I know we have people joining us from different provinces, but in Ontario, we have uh, that program, Seniors Without Walls, uh, that that uh, is run by the um, older adult centers um, across Ontario. So we often partner with them to do education sessions where seniors call in uh, on a, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, depending on when they host uh, their, their programs. And those are very um, regional. So depending on where you live, if there's a senior center that has that program, um, and they have different topics uh, that they bring in speakers and they could talk about frauds and scams. They could talk about this uh, issue. So giving people the base knowledge over the phone. I see Emily shaking her head. So um, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add, Emily, but I know that they are very well received and they are continuing uh, today, even though some centers are open, they're still continuing with that phone program. I 
I can put the uh, the website in the in the chat box. I'll just look go for look for it. So um, we we had a question earlier, Emily. I wasn't sure if you were looking to unmute yourself to say something or no. Okay, we had a question earlier that was a bit more technical, and I think Lisa uh, started answering it in writing, which had to do with virus scanners. Um, somebody was asking, are they actually still efficient? I've heard they're not. What do you recommend? Yeah, so the number one point of compromise is phishing emails. Mm -hmm. So I think it was mentioned earlier and I touched on it very briefly. Uh, you, uh, for a tip, you would never want to click on a link or download any attachments in an email. It's always better when in doubt to contact the person directly to send an email if you can, or just go directly to the website. Don't interact with the body of an email if it's unknown or if it's urging or we're asking for you to do something or you know pretending to be someone that you know is asking for help as an example um, but with regards to virus scanners virus scanners are becoming less and less um, um, helpful they're only about five percent effective because most of the points of compromise are through uh, internal methods like remote access Trojan, where someone clicks on a link and then you know they're automatically given access to that computer directly. So you don't know that they're there, but they're interacting on the back end. Um, so it's always really important. You can use different virus scanners. Some are better than others, but you do have to update it. And the best practice really to avoid getting hit with malware is just you know update and patch your systems and backup, as I mentioned, because even if you do get hit with some kind of malware, having a backup of your operating system and data, you can at least restore in the event of. So that would be my best advice. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other active question in the Q&A box right now. So if anybody has questions, please type them in there. If I've missed anything in the chat box, I'll go and have a quick look. But I have a question which we haven't really touched on. And it's, uh, we're talking about you know tools and principles for keeping safe. But I guess I'll take it one step, one step further, let's say, something does happen, you accidentally click on the wrong link, or you don't realize that you've fed information to somebody who is not who they claim to be. Um, what are your top tips for reacting? Because I know in those moments, especially with technology, panic can set in. And panic is usually nobody's friend uh, when it comes to reacting. Do uh, Let's start with Kara. Kara, would you have a couple of, you know, guiding <laughs> tips for anyone like this um well i know that we, so we do have some um you know some um tips within the so there are worksheets that definitely cover this in more detail than i'll give right now but i would say um i'll, I'll just maybe speak off the top of my head what's coming to mind is if you're concerned that somebody has access to your device for example um i would say the first thing to do is log out of all of your accounts um and you know to to change your passwords if that's a if that's a concern um and to remember to make your email password different from all your other passwords but again i think it was lisa who mentioned if you have a password manager that's a good tool to help you do that um you can run some software like there is some uh, malware uh, software um but yeah if you're concerned that someone has access to your device the biggest thing is to log out and to, to re-log into those um to those accounts it's pretty it's pretty rare though that that does happen i, I would say um uh i think um and of course I, I guess just one other thing that we haven't like really mentioned but like if you see an app that looks unfamiliar for example so you think okay there's you should delete it so if there's or uninstall it we would say um so we have a whole like cheat ever how to do that um so if that's if that's a concern like you think there's something on your phone that it looks unfamiliar um uh what else um i mean this is very extreme but if there you have a concern that again either someone has accessed uh, your device or some accounts are compromised there are ways to, to wipe the device and i think that's why it's been mentioned uh, in this panel to back up all of your devices that's of course in the instance that you might have to what we call wipe the device and so there's tools about how to go into your settings and sort of you know factor to reset a device if that is the case but I, I do want to just emphasize that those are 
rare circumstances because I do think um, sometimes, uh, at least we learned in our uh, research and fo the focus groups we conducted, that that can be a stumbling block for people, especially um, folks who have experienced abuse. Um, they can become quite concerned that this is going to be a sort of regular um, occurrence or threat to being online. And so one thing that we do want to emphasize is that like there are certainly risks and there are steps that you can take to avoid them, but that um, an instance where you would have to completely wipe your device, for example, is quite is quite rare. Um, but yeah, we have um, in, in that digital smarts uh, work, workshop, you can click through different uh, worksheets that would, for example, walk you through how to do um, like a device wipe or walk you through how to reset some accounts and that sort of thing. Um, if I can add uh, as well, if you know for sure that your information has been compromised, something else you're going to want to do is talk to your bank. Uh, you're also going to want to set up credit alerts with uh, Western, not Western Union, the other one, <laughs> uh, Equifax and uh, the other big guy, uh, and get those on your account so that you're going to be alerted if somebody does apply for credit in your in your name. It makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, and yeah, and call your bank. I also want to there's a couple of things that you can look for if you think you're compromised. Look for your, your device or your mouse moving or things happening on your desktop without your interaction. So for example, if you're you know watching a streaming movie and you see your mouse move or you see something, a window pop up, that could be an indicator that your endpoint has been compromised. Also, you want to look for um, your machine slowing down. Uh, you know, your resources on your device being heavily used. And also the third thing I would say is looking for high bandwidth. So for example, if it's on your mobile device, a tablet or an iPhone, and all of a sudden your data usage goes up and you're paying, you know, uh, by gigabyte or megabyte through your service provider, that can also be an indicator that your endpoint is compromised. I will say that one of the things that I always recommend is Create it, when you get a new device, uh, create system restore points regularly, because one of the things that malware, two things that malware will do initially is turn off the antivirus so it doesn't work, that's very easy to do. And secondly, it will disable your system restore. So if you check to make sure that you have a system restore, it, it allows you to enable back to a certain point so that your system is restored to what it was prior to being infected. Um, and that's a very effective way. Um, just to the point of uh, email compromises and your password being compromised, I don't recommend that you log off of emails before changing the passwords because you could actually be um, locking yourself out of an account if you log off. It's always best to check your password and make sure that if, if you think it's compromised and create a new one, but don't log off first if you think it's compromised because you could lock yourself out. Pro tip, thank you very much. And I can personally will never uh, say enough good about password managers. They've really changed my life for the better. So I strongly endorse your message. Uh, it will make your life safer and easier. Um, I see, I think we have one more question. Actually, it was a question connect, um, regarding how to identify remote access programs, you know, if somebody has installed a remote access program on your computer one way or another. Um, I mean, Lisa, you touched on this in terms of symptoms, like watching uh, windows open or, or point or move without your participation. That's usually a sign. But are there specific programs that people can run to find what's been installed? Well, yes, they're very specific tools, but they're very technical. Just having a regular antivirus or an anti-malware solution in place where you can run and check for those kinds of malicious activities uh, with behaviors happening in your computer in the background that should take care of it. But for the most part, I will say, uh, sadly, that antivirus and anti malware solutions are not effective um, there. It's so easy to compromise an endpoint and it happens all the time. Uh, every or I've worked at literally thousands of organizations and every single one of them have been compromised in some way or another. So, um, and same with endpoints, we just don't know what oftentimes uh, individuals are not targeted because what is the, the end goal is usually there's different motivations and means behind an attack. It could be for hacktivism, it could be financial means, which is the majority of um, 
you know, motivations behind ransomware attacks that we have. Uh, it could be cyber espionage, it could be nation state attacks. Um, there's a whole bunch of different motives. Uh, so individuals in general are not targeted unless they actually are a key figure for an organization. And then yes, they could be targeted and they wanna make sure that they have uh, put certain measures in place uh, to protect themselves online. And that often refers to older individuals like executives that come from a, a generation where we didn't have technology so actively, didn't grow up with it. So, you know, we, 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 a lot of the work that I do is educating um, senior executives around cybersecurity best practices. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think that took us to the end of our audience questions. So maybe I'll just open it up to the floor. Do you have any last comments or observations for the people who are with us? And also, please, I try to keep up and share links to all the things you were talking about. But if I've missed something, please add them to the chat box and uh, do let people know where they can find the next session or the next webinar um, that you will be hosting about this. But um, Deborah, is there any any last words? <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a lot to be said, but uh, I would say the, the main message. So if you're going to not focus on the technology, uh, focus on being skeptical. And we really have to drive home the point that it's okay to be rude. It's okay to hang up the phone. It's okay to delete the email. You don't have to talk to anybody. Hang up and call the person directly. And it's it, that's my message. It's okay to be rude. <laughs> I like this. Thank you. It's okay to say no, right? Say no, hang up, and delete it. Perfect. Emily? Yeah, I think it was, you know, a great conversation and lots of tips and, and pointers were shared. I hope that they were useful. Um, yeah, I think that was um, digital literacy is is so important um, as again for, you know, social participation and, and inclusion. So, um, yeah, check out some of the, the programs that are available. Thank you, Emily. Kara. Again, not much else to add. I think it was a wonderful conversation. I know there was so much shared. So I would just emphasize kind of what uh, we've been saying, which is that um, there are lots of folks doing really great work in this space. So if you have questions or um, you're looking for support, I think um, anyone on this call would be happy to, to either, you know, take that up themselves or direct you to a group or folks who can help you. So um, yeah, thanks again for having me. Thank you very much. And Lisa? I just want to say thank you for the uh, the privilege and the honor to speak about this topic and really uh, it's great um, you know to hear everyone's suggestions and to learn of all the work that you ladies are doing uh, to help seniors in the community I really love seeing and hearing about that and for anyone that has any specific questions maybe more on the technical side if you do want to reach out um, and work with us or look for opportunities uh, to host or co-host events in the future don't hesitate Wonderful. And Ryan, I think you have a slide that um, shows everyone's contact information. Um, these will be made available. So whether you've attended live today or if you're seeing the recording later, all the information about our panelists, where you can find them, what information you can, uh, what their contact information is, is available uh, on eapon.ca and cnpa.ca and the recording will be added shortly and then if you are we've sort of tickled your interest and you want to learn more specifically about current online scams and frauds um, we are going to be hosting together again two webinars by the end of august oh, october I'm still hoping for summer. Um, <laughs> on October 26th, we'll be doing it in, in English. And on October 27th, we'll be uh, hosting the same presentation in French. And this will be with a um, speaker from the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. So we hope to see you there as well. You can see this information on your screen. Of course, um, as we just told you, don't click on anything. Um, here are some links for you, but these are safe. <laughs> and recommended if you wish to help support both of our organizations um, in keeping those webinars regular and free for everyone. Uh, we always appreciate donations. It's a beautiful sign of support and it endears us to keep going. And here you are, you can see our speakers contact info, Lisa, Cara, Deborah, and Emily. Um, thank 
thank you so very much for joining us today and for being so generous with your time and your knowledge. And um, you will also be receiving a link for a survey to hear what you thought of the uh, session and what we can do better for next time. Uh, you'll be receiving this from, I believe, Ryan. Anything yep. else, Ryan? Our just our contact information. If you want to reach out to Benedict and I, um, either one of us, there's our contact information, our social media channels as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to the panels. Thank you, Benedict, for. Uh, moderating the, the session today and for everyone's feedback. I will be sharing uh, many of the links that were posted today in the chat. I know there was some people asking for those. I will upload those when um, the recording and the PowerPoint are uploaded as well. Um, hopefully maybe today or by the end of tomorrow that should be up on our website. Um, and then in a couple of days, I think, uh, with Benedict to have that up on her site as well. So thank you all again, and thank you to our panelists for taking the time to uh, to be with us and share your, your uh, wealth of, of knowledge um, and to our ASL interpreters um, today. Hopefully we kept our pace good for you. <laughs> so thank you very much, and um, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinars. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you.